Thanks for coming down, Doctor. Hello, folks. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, it's nice to be here this evening. I hope everybody is well. I'm going to spend about the next 30 minutes. We have a lot of information to cover. Some of it is comprehensive. I tried to keep it as simple as I can. If you do have questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Um, please stay muted unless you have a question for me, or you can save it till the very end. Thank you. So. Code gray in the ER. Code gray in the ER. Code gray in the ER. The first thing I thought I would do is talk about some common breast cancer myths. I picked the eight most common breast cancer myths that women ask about all the time. And so we're going to go through them one at a time now. Myth number one, breast cancer always appears in the form of a lump or with pain. Many women think that if they're experiencing pain in their breasts, it's a sign of breast cancer. That's extremely rare for breast cancer to cause, bre to cause breast pain. I have patients come to me every week saying that they have pain in their breast and they're worried about it being cancer. Not so. In most instances, breast pain is not associated with breast cancer. Also no, of note is that someone who's found to have a lump in the breast, whether it's found by a doctor or found by yourself, it also does not mean it's cancer. In fact, most breast cancers are not, uh, most lumps in the breast are not cancer. About 80 to 85 percent of breast lumps are, are benign. So if you do find a lump, yes, it has to be uh, evaluated. It does need attention, but very rarely are lumps in the breast cancerous. However, there are things in the breast that can't be felt that might be cancer. For instance, microscopic calcium deposits can only be detect detected by a mammogram. And I'll talk about that some more as we go through this. That's why having a yearly mammogram is so important. Second myth, eating organic foods will reduce my risk of breast cancer. While organic foods that are not exposed to chemicals, pesticides, certain fertilizers, or GMO, the jury is still out on this regarding whether there's a benefit in eating uh, organic foods as it relates to reducing the risk of breast cancer. There are proven ways, however, to lower your risk for breast cancer by eating a healthy, well-balanced diet, low in fat and low in processed and fast foods. Of course, eat plenty of fresh vegetables, plenty of fruits and veggies, fresh food and whole grains, and stay well hydrated, lots and lots of water. These healthy eating habits will help also maintain pr proper body weight, which is important since being uh, overweight or obese does increase the risk of breast cancer, especially if the obesity comes in menopause. Healthy lifestyle cho choices are also very important. For instance, smoking. Most people don't know, but smoking is a direct cause of breast cancer, as is consuming large amounts of alcohol. Both have been shown to increase the risk. Third myth, why don't women, uh, women don't need to have an annual mammogram? Not true. Women age 40 and over should have a mammogram every year. Some people think that they can skip a year, but that's not the case. In fact, women with a family history or a personal history or have problems, lumpy breasts or past biopsies showing things that might be pre-cancer, those women might need mammograms earlier than age 40. So ladies, you need a mammogram every year, despite what you might read or hear in the press. And they start at age 40. Myth number four, if I have an MRI of the breast, I don't need a mammogram. Also false. An MRI of the breast, although it's a great test, it doesn't replace a mammogram. In fact, MRI complements mammography. With what I do, we don't rely on any one modality to diagnose breast cancer. We use all tools that are available to us, including physical examination of the breast, mammography, ultrasound of the breast or sonogram, MRI of the breast, etc. MRI is a problem solving tool that, a tool that allows us to get greater clarity. And um, if we need more information, it gives us a deeper, more thorough look inside the breast. Number five, my father's genetics have nothing to do with my risk of breast cancer. This is extremely important for you, to, not only for you to know, but also to pass on to your loved ones. Most people think that only their mother's genetics affect them if they're a woman as it relates to women's issues like breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Not true. 
this is a misconception. We get half of our genetic information from our mother. We get half from our father. It's equally important to know both sides of the family so that those genetics can be taken into account to make sure that you're well. Next, having a mastectomy removes all chances of getting the cancer again. Well, mastectomy is the best way to reduce the risk of getting breast cancer or getting it again, but it's only about 95%. I shouldn't say only 95%. That's very, very good. But not all breast tissue is removed in a mastectomy. We remove about 95% of it. And it's, again, the best tool we have, but we do not have a tool that's 100% effective. So a mastectomy is the best, but it's not 100%. Next, a breast cancer diagnosis is a death sentence. Also not true. The fact is when breast cancer is caught early, and you've heard that a million times, early detection, there's more than a 90% survival rate. Even breast cancers that are caught at what we would consider a slightly more advanced stage or a moderate stage of disease, the survival rate is still 80% or higher. That's amazing if you think about 20, 30, or 40 years ago when the survival rates were not like this at all. We have amazing tools at our disposal and early detection is the best tool. The bottom line is when breast cancer is caught early, we can treat women and they can live a normal life. This also goes to the importance of annual mammography and physical breast examination. Next myth, needle biopsies cause the spread of breast cancer. I hear this a lot. Do needle biopsies, doctor, if, I, if you poke my lump with a, with a needle or you operate on me and you expose it to air, will it let the cancer spread like wildfire? Maybe some of you have heard this. That's simply not true, not the case. Been studied a million times scientifically. Needle biopsies are safe and accurate to determine if a lump or a finding is cancerous and it does not spread the cancer. So <clears throat> those are the common myths that I see. Let's move on to some information about breast cancer and specifically some information here in New York. On August uh, last year, 2019, the governor signed Shannon's law. This requires large group insurers to cover mammography. Prior to that, some insurance companies did not cover mammography for all women, especially women under the age of 40. So Governor Cuomo, he signed legislation requiring insurance companies to cover necessary mammograms for women under 40. This legislation was known as Shannon's Law, named after Shannon Saturno of Babylon. She was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 28, passed away at 31, and this was diagnosed while she was pregnant. Insurance companies refused to allow her to have coverage for a mammography when they thought that she needed it. <clears throat> Currently, many insurers are only required to cover them for women over 40 but there's 12,000 cases of breast cancer in women under 40. So now that's no longer the case. And several local senators, state senators and assembly people were um, really supportive of this and we thank them for helping getting this legislation passed. So what about young women with breast cancer? Well, breast cancer in young women is rare but there are more than 250,000 women in the United States who are living with it under the age of 40. And we also know that breast cancer in younger women tends to be more aggressive, a higher mortality rate and higher risk of spread. So it's important if you know women who are younger than 40 to make sure that they're checking their breasts and they're getting the necessary intervention if they have a lump or something unusual. There's no really good screening tool for women under 40. Mammography alone does not often work terribly well because women's breasts, when they're very young, are very dense and thick and firm. And mammography is not by itself the greatest tool. We have to add other tools in, like I discussed before with MRI or ultrasound <clears throat> to help us diagnose these younger women. And this goes, just goes to show you this graph if you look, 
younger women between the ages of uh, 20 and, thir and 40 over here, their survival rate is actually lower. You can see survival along the left-hand side. Their survival is lower if they get breast cancer when they're younger. And look at the women after the age of 40, 45, until they're 80, the survival rate goes way up. So it's important if you're young, even though it's rare, to still pay attention. But breast cancer is the, is the most common cancer for women in uh, young younger women between 15 and 39. Even though it's rare, it's the most common cancer. And it's the second most common cancer for all women, other than skin cancer. The number one cancer is skin. In 2019, the American Cancer Society projected about 270,000 new cases of invasive, that's the dangerous kind, of breast cancer in the United States and 48,000 cases of the non-dangerous kind, what's called in situ cancer. And again, about 13,000 of these cases are under the age of 40. Under the age of 45, there'll be about 45,000 cases, and a bunch of women will die on, from if they're under the age of 40 each year. So you can see it's not only a disease of older women, and nearly 80% of young women diagnosed with breast cancer find their cancers by themselves, which again is a statement about why it's important to check yourself even when you're young. This is the most common cancer in pregnant women and in women who recently gave birth, which is staggering to me. Um, it occurs once in every 3,000 pregnancies. It's a, a real problem. Young women generally face more aggressive cancers, as I said before, and lower survival rates. Um, and the reason is, is that these cancers are biologically different, meaning that they're more aggressive. And they're more aggressive because younger women have more estrogen. That's one of the reasons. And it spreads more frequently in younger women. Even in African-American women, they have a disproportionately higher rate of death compared to other groups. And uh, Hispanic women as well, also, reasons we don't understand, but those two groups, for some reason, have more aggressive cancers. Part of the problem is they're found later, but part of the problem is, is that they're biologically more aggressive. So what are the risk factors for breast cancer? Here are some of them not necessarily in the order of importance, but having a personal history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So if you've had it before, you're at risk of getting it again. Having a family history. This is pretty much the number one risk factor for getting a breast cancer. A previous biopsy showing atypia or something that is precancerous, not yet cancer, but very high risk. Having your first menstrual period when you're very young, under the age of 12, or starting menopause un after the age of 55. Why? Because the younger you have, I'm sorry, you're, you're, the younger you are when you get your period, and the older you are when you stop having periods, that means there's more years of estrogen around your body, and that incre actually increases the risk of breast cancer because there's more fuel around to cause breast cancer more years of estrogen. Never having had children is a risk factor. First child after age of 30. Genetics, I mentioned that briefly before. Having the BRCA or one or two gene or nine other breast cancer related genes that we now know of. Drinking a lot of alcohol, being overweight after menopause, gaining weight as an adult, and smoking. So here we are at St. Joseph Hospital in Bethpage and our new cancer center, and our brand new breast center, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do. So it all is about screening. Everything's about screening, whether we're talking about breast cancer, whether we're talking about cholesterol, blood pressure, um, screening for skin cancer, colon cancer, etc. It all starts with screening, and screening comes from self-referral. People say, I got to go get checked. 
things like this, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, people say, I got to get my mammogram. I can't tell you, ladies, how many women I see that don't have an annual mammogram, don't have a mammogram in four or five years. It's amazing to me. They have information from the internet, from family, from friends, from their physicians, from social media, media from their primary care or OBGYNs. They get funneled in and they get screened. And they get screened by way of mammography, which is the workhorse of breast cancer screening, breast ultrasound, breast MRI, self-examination, breast self-exam, clinical examination by your doctor. And then they go into diagnosis, which is with a biopsy typically. Biopsies these days are not like they used to be. These are needle biopsies. They're done with local anesthesia. They're done much easier than it used to be. Very rarely do we do open surgical biopsies now. And then if we find something that needs addressing, it goes into the funnel of treatment and that equals surgery and maybe other treatments uh, along the way. So here at our breast center, um, I have uh, sort of a saying to everybody, yeah, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but Breast Cancer Awareness Month is every month, all 12, October through the next September is Breast Cancer Awareness. All of these are awareness months, and we need to stay on guard and protect ourselves and our loved ones. So pass this information along. I want to talk to you about some statistics and some, some advances and some great news. This is back in 2005, the cover of US News and World Report. Are we finally, finally beating breast cancer? New breakthroughs offer women more hope than ever. Very true. And these are some statistics from 2005 with the rate of breast cancer in every state. The important thing to remember is that about one in eight or one in nine women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. That's about 13% of women if they live long enough to the age of 85, 13 out of 100 women are going to have some form of breast cancer. But remember, about 80 to 85 percent of breast lumps are not cancer. So don't be afraid by this information. Be empowered by it. If you find a lump, there's about an 80 to 85 percent chance it's nothing. So let's look at some statistics as we move forward from 2005. In 2006, there were about 200, this is 14 years ago, 250,000, I'm sorry, 215,000 cases of invasive cancer. If you remember my numbers from before, this was much lower in 2006. An additional 55,000 cases of in situ cancer. This number is much higher back then than it is now. Just remember these numbers. And about 41,000 women died back in 2006. Also, for those men in your life, I know there are no men on the Zoom, but men account for about 1% of breast cancer in the U.S. Moving ahead to 2013 now, just seven years ago, the number increased to 232,000 cases of invasive, 57,000 cases of in situ. So the number of cases are going up. We're finding more, but there are a lot of reasons for that. One reason is we're looking harder. More and more women are getting screened. The screening tools are much better. We're finding it earlier and when women are younger, which is great. Because we're finding them when women are younger, they don't develop into these serious breast cancers that cause death. We're finding them earlier and earlier um, stage early detection. However, look at this number. About 40,000 women died that year. Less women than the years before. Great news. So even though the number of cases is increasing, the number of women dying is going down. And that year, 2013, there were 2,240 cases of breast cancer in men and 450,000 cases that year of breast cancer in the world. Remember that number. Now we move ahead to last year, and these are the latest statistics that are available because the, the statistics are compiled after the year is over. There will be estimated this year 268,000 cases, relatively stable, but slightly higher. 
48,000 cases of in situ, 268,000 of invasive. The number is slightly lower of in situ, meaning non-dangerous breast cancer, non-lethal. And about 40,000 or 41,000 deaths, about the same as the years before. Men, however, look at this number, increase more and more men with breast cancer. Why? Probably more awareness. And I do know that a lot of men that worked at 9-11, one of the cancers they're getting is breast. And I've seen a number of police officers in my practice with breast cancer. But look down here, almost over 2 million cases of breast cancer worldwide. Remember that number I showed you before? 450,000 cases, now 2 million cases. However, overall in the past 25 years, a 27% decrease in death. Amazing what we're doing now. And this chart is really difficult to read and I don't expect you to read it, but I put it up there to remind me of what went on <clears throat> by state. And these are the states here, all 50 and the number of cases of breast cancer in 2005 by state. If you look down here to New York, there were about 14,400 cases. Only California had more cases than us back then. If you look now in 2019, the statistics changed a little bit. If you look at New York, the number of cases is up to almost 18,000 and California still remains number one. But look at Florida, 19, almost 20,000 cases, and Texas, 18,000 cases. In the past, those numbers were very, very low. But look at the demographic shifts, all the people from the Northeast moving south, all the people from California exiting in mass numbers going to Texas. So part of it is demographic shift. Part of it is the numbers of breast cancer slightly increasing. What about Long Island in 2015? In Suffolk County, 1,300 cases of breast cancer. In Nassau County, about 1,300 cases of breast cancer. <clears throat> if I showed you these statistics from years past, this is a definite change. Many more cases in Suffolk now than even five years ago. Again, demographics, five, 10, 15 years ago, many less people lived in Suffolk. Why is this happening? Why are we getting all these cases of breast cancer? Well, some of it is known and some of it is not known. But as I said before, there's a pr improved detection and awareness. We have an aging population. We have a growing population, just more people. So this is a disease of women as they get older, more and more women getting a little bit older, more and more breast cancer. Add that to detection and awareness, the numbers are increasing. Changing population, people from other parts of the world coming here. It's a changing disease also. We see different types of breast cancer happening now. So all of these are factors as to why. Then. There's hormones, birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, women having menopause later on, increased estrogen in the blood, toxins in our food supply, perhaps in our water, mass produced foods that are less healthy and less nutritious, dense breast tissue, I'll talk about that, obesity I've mentioned, diet and lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, and poor diet, delayed or no pregnancy, and certainly stress related, for so many, related to so many things in our lives, and the unknown, and then genetics. So in 2013, you may remember this, Angelina Jolie, this was a New York Times headline. She opted for a double mastectomy after testing positive for the BRCA gene. Her mother and her grandmother um, had breast and ovarian cancer, so she decided to get tested. 
was found to have the BRCA gene and opted to have a double mastectomy. Right after that happened, the number of women walks, walking into my office asking for double mastectomies skyrocketed. I call it the Angelina Jolie effect. Everybody wanted a double mastectomy because of risk and f uh, fear, mostly fear. And so the demand for the procedure is still increasing. And that's partly because of this, the media and Hollywood scaring people. We also do it for risk reduction. If a woman has high risk or early, already has an early breast cancer, we might offer a mastectomy and try to save the skin and try to save the nipples. The things we do here at St. Joseph is uh, they're just amazing what we can do now, even in a woman who needs to have a breast removed or both breasts. And then of course, hysterectomy to help prevent ovarian or uterine cancer. But she's not the only one. Juliana Rancic, Christina Applegate, Sharon Osborne, all double mastectomies to prevent breast cancer from recurring or occurring at all. Remember though, this disease affects everybody, young, old, black, white, male, female, doesn't matter. Just a moment on chemicals in our drinking water and here on Long Island, we hear a lot about that. So what about it? We do know that there's a toxic plume in our groundwater and some of our water is contaminated from Grumman. Right now, there's about a two mile wide by four mile long plume right under parts of Bethpage, moving south toward Massapequa, toward the Great South Bay, moving a little bit each day. This contains chemicals like 1,4-dioxane, trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene. We don't know if these are the causes of the problem. The Navy and has finally decided to try to clean this mess up and they've appropriated lots and lots of funds to clean it up. And if it hasn't already started, it's, they're going to uh, start to clean that uh, plume up very, very soon. But what's also important to notice that even our personal care products and detergents dump chemicals into the groundwater. And so it's not only Grumman, it's what we do in our lives that's polluting the waterway and maybe our groundwater. And then what about cesspools that used to be here, leaking from cesspools? What's the remedy? drink purified bottle or bottled water. That's the, only, that's the best we have right now. I wanted to talk about dense breasts. And dense breasts is re really an interesting topic for me because what you can see here, four different mammograms on four different women. And this is a common risk factor for developing breast cancer. So number A is a woman probably a little bit older fatty breast, all of this gray tissue is fat. All the estrogen in the blood is gone or very, very low. So the breasts are not being stimulated by estrogen. Like when you were pregnant, the breast gets stimulated by estrogen. They become engorged and swollen and painful and tender. When there's no estrogen around, that doesn't happen. The breasts become less glandular and more fatty. And B is partially dense, so a lot of fat and some gland. This glandular tissue is where the breast milk is made. And then C, more glandular, probably a younger woman starting to maybe approach menopause. So less and less gland, some more and more fat. And then D, very, very, very dense, probably a young woman who has a lot of estrogen around. The point is when you look at D and this woman has a mammogram, it's very difficult to see what's going on in here as compared to A, where it's very easy to see what's going on in here. The reason why dense breasted women have a higher risk of breast cancer is because the dense breasts occur in younger women usually, and that tissue is thought to be immature tissue, more susceptible to toxins. If you have breast cancer, I'm sorry, if you have dense breasts, it's important to know that because we, we need to do other tests to make sure we can see through this dense breast tissue here. Mammogram does an okay job, but we need to do other testing. Over 30 states now in pink require 
doctors, radiology groups, and the labs to notify you if you have dense breasts so you can take further action. This was started by a woman in Connecticut who developed breast cancer. She had dense breasts. She had a mammogram. It didn't find it. She later found out she had dense breasts and went on a crusade to get further testing for if you have dense breasts. And now 35, I think 35 or 36 states have uh, additional testing that's generally covered by insurance. And so dense breasts equal increased risk and we need closer observation. I advise you to have self-examination monthly, have your doctor examine your breasts once at least once a year and maybe twice, three-dimensional mammography, and add ultrasound or sonography if you, have, if you have dense breasts. You also need to have an ultrasound. So ladies, if you have dense breasts, you also need an ultrasound or an MRI or other tests that we use, things like contrast enhanced mammography or molecular breast imaging or other tests that we use to help diagnose breast cancers in difficult uh, breast exams and breast mammographies like I showed you. And a little bit about genetics. We now identify and manage people who have breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, meaning that they were tested for the BRCA gene and they're positive. But there are now 11 genes in total, nine since BRCA1, BRCA2 were uh, discovered in 1994. There are now 11 other genes that we know of and some of them are listed here on the left. This is simple, it's a blood test. And the way we do that is we draw your blood, we send it to a special laboratory. Within about 10 to 14 days, those results come back and we could determine if you carry the gene that increases your risk for breast cancer. And what do we do if we find it? There are a lot of interventions to help protect you. Who do we test? We test women who are at high risk, family history or personal history. And so again, these are some of the genes that we uh, test for. And we have lots and lots of diseases that we can uncover that you may be susceptible to that we can help prevent if we understand. And we know this information before the disease shows up. So this is life saving as prevention. So the question is, can we prevent breast cancer? The answer is yes. So I thought I would talk for a minute about the breast. What is the breast? The breast is a gland. The gland makes milk and it's for nursing newborns and young children. And it consists of the glandular tissue where the milk is made or here. And I showed you that on the dense breast mammogram. It's got surrounding fat as sort of an envelope or a cushion, and it's got the ductal structures, the plumbing, if you will. The milk is made into the plumbing, down the pipes to the nipple for nursing and breastfeeding. Most cancers, where do they begin? They begin in the milk duct. That's why they're called ductal cancers. They begin in the milk duct. But there are other cancers that begin in other parts of the breast as well. And so a normal duct looks like this. If you took a straw and looked down the straw the long way, you'd see right down the tube. Well, that's looking down the tube of a duct that's empty and crystal clear. When the breast starts to change and things start to happen, the duct gets filled in with additional cells. And the lumen or the opening of the straw or the duct begins to narrow. Sometimes these cells begin to change and all the cells start to look different. Here you can see all the cells look approximately the same. Here, these cells start to look a little different, and that's when it becomes precancer. Very common, atypical cells. Next, those atypical cells continue to multiply, and the lumen of, or the opening of the straw, or the duct, is completely filled in. And that's when a tumor starts to grow. And those are the in situ cancers, the non-dangerous variety, the early breast cancer. 
And if left alone and undiagnosed, then it becomes invasive. And these are the dangerous ones, which is why, again, it's so important to have early detection. You want to find the cancer when it's in situ, and you want to find it when it's pre-cancer. And remember, if you detect and treat it early, there's a much better chance of normal survival. So can it be prevented? I think I've proven to you that it can. Some other ways are with monthly self-examination at home. And ladies, if you don't know how to do this, I encourage you to do so. The best way to do it is in front of the mirror, in my opinion, so you can look in the mirror and see what you're doing. If you don't know how to do this, you can go on my website. My website is listed in this talk. If you have a pencil, it's breastcarespecialist.com, and you'll see it again, breastcarespecialist.com. On page five, there's a tutorial on how to examine your breasts. If you Google it, you'll get tons of sites that show you how to examine your breasts. The point is, try to do it, learn how to do it. If you can't, have your doctor teach you how to do it. If not, come to us, we'll teach you how to do it. But a lot of breast cancers are found by early detection by a woman examining their own breasts. And then get your breasts examined, ladies, at least once a year by your doctor. Very important, at least once a year. If you're high risk, twice a year. There are some women who have the BRCA gene or another gene. I see them four times a year. So, so it depends on what's going on. At least once a year by your GYN or somebody like me. And this is not the way to have your breast exam. This is just put in there as a little bit of a joke. You want to do it privately and uh, with your own doctor, one-on-one. -on -one. We don't want to do it this way. And so 3D mammography or tomosynthesis mammography, perhaps you've heard these words. Those are the latest and the greatest, the state-of-the-art mammograms, and they begin at age 40. Not at age 45, not at age 55, not every other year, and not stopping at age 75. American Cancer Society will have you believe, and others, that you don't need a mammogram every year after, after 55, and you don't need a mammogram after 75. There are no experts who do this every day, including myself, who agree with that. Mammogram every year starting at 40, earlier if you need it in addition to self-exam and doctor exam. And so again, we do this um, annually. And just to show you one picture down here in the bottom as compared to these, these are the um, old fashioned way of doing mammogram, ladies. You, I'm sure you know if you've had mammography, we take a picture from the top of the breast, we take a picture from the side of the breast, and that was it. The new mammograms take slices through the breast multiple slices. The best way to explain that is if I opened a book and looked at two pages, that was the old-fashioned mammogram. The new mammograms or the 3D tomosynthesis mammograms, they see so much more information because it's like taking that same paperback book and thumbing through the pages like you whiz through the pages and all of those pages are a slice through your breast. That's how much more information we get now. And yes, ladies, if women controlled medicine, it would be called the manogram, and they would do this to us. Again, just another cartoon to lighten the, uh, the uh, atmosphere with this serious talk. But just a point of information, ladies, men did not invent mammography. It was invented by a woman. And then we have breast ultrasound. Very, very important in young women and those women with dense breasts very important and you can see some of the beautiful imaging look at this here's a 3d or almost 4d mammogram that we can see this lump in the breast right here that was not seen on a regular mammogram this is so advanced now that we have ultrasound that's in a form of a laptop that's in a handheld version where we can see the images right on our smartphone and here's some beautiful images. These are ultrasound images 
of things that could not be seen on mammography. And then there's MRI. Breast MRI, again, is not a good screening tool. It, we use it to help us find things when we're suspicious, when we need more information, when we have a complex problem, when we're not sure what we're seeing, we have MRIs done. They do not replace mammography. But you can see how beautiful the images are. You can see this lump in the breast right here on a breast MRI and another one right there as opposed to a normal MRI down at the bottom. MRI is a little bit more difficult to get through. You have to lay on a table face down. It takes about 20 or 25 minutes. And just a word about how we diagnose it. I talked about that before. We went from um, screening to diagnosis to, to treatment. So we're in the diagnosis mode now. We found a lump. And almost everything we do now is minimally invasive. In fact, removing lumps can be done in a minimally invasive fashion. What does that mean? That means a needle through a little local anesthesia with a tiny little incision where a Band-Aid gets put on afterwards and you go right home. No surgery. And most women can receive an accurate biopsy with a needle. No more surgery to find out what's wrong. And here are some examples. This is the old fashioned surgery with a scalpel where we made a cut. And here's an example of various types of needle biopsies that we use and the amazing information we can get. Here we evacuate some fluid. Here we evacuate some pieces of the tumor and even some larger pieces of tumor or mass or lump. And I myself have removed literally thousands of lumps in the breast this way, where the lump is completely removed with a needle with no surgery. And then there are other methods using stereotactic, very advanced imaging or ultrasound guided biopsies. We have this, and you'll see on the next slide, here's an ultrasound finding a lump in purple. This is inside the breast. Here's the nipple. Here's the breast tissue. Here's the lump. It can be seen on ultrasound. And here, this little silver or gray gadget is the needle going into the lump to do a biopsy. One of the tools that I use looks like this. I guess it looks scary, but it's really not. It's a needle about the width of a pencil, which goes into the breast through a tiny incision, enables, to me, to get, uh, enables me to get very, very accurate uh, tissue, make accurate diagnoses, find out what the lump is, and in, as I said, in many cases, remove the whole lump. And here it is on the stereotactic table. This is a special table where a woman lies up here on this table face down. The breast is suspended through this opening. And this is the needle that I use. It goes into the breast. And this is how it works. The needle in the breast below the lump, this trough or depression in the needle actually sucks the tissue in. The tissue or the lump gets sucked in and then a cutting device comes down along and cuts pieces off of the lump. Here is the piece of the tissue now cut off inside the device, and it gets withdrawn to the back of the device and comes out this tubing into a collecting chamber, and that's how, that is how I'm able to remove parts of lumps, even the entire lump, as opposed to open, invasive, surgery done in an operating room through a big cut in the breast under anesthesia where there's general uh, anesthesia in many cases with scarring and disfiguring uh, openings and stitches, painful, more costly, and longer recovery. We don't really do this much anymore um, if we don't have to. And so there's the opening um, as a, and that big opening compared to a little tiny opening we don't want to do this anymore, and we don't. What else is, can we do to help prevent breast cancer? Well, now we have certain medicines. Maybe some of you have heard of tamoxifen or Evista. These drugs help block estrogen. Estrogen is the fuel for many breast cancers, and ladies, that's made by your body for all good things, but it does have some negative things as well. One of them 
it helps increase the risk of breast cancer. These medications help lower or remove estrogen and prevent breast cancer. So again, like with genetics, like with early detection, like with pharmaceutical, with medicine, we can prevent it. And then we have preventative surgery, like Angelina Jolie had. We prevented a very high risk of breast cancer in her by removing her breasts before the breast cancer developed. And we do this all the time. And you get about a 95% risk reduction in cancer patients and about a 95 to 100% reduction in high risk women. And here are some examples, ladies, I just wanted to show you that a mastectomy is not a horror show like it used to be. Clearly, it's a big operation. It's uh, very invasive. It's very disfiguring or could be. It's a very serious psychological trauma to many women, understandably. But we have such amazing technology now that both of these women seen here had bilateral, both breasts removed. If you look at the women on the woman on your left, these are reconstructed breasts after a double mastectomy. Those are her nipples. That is all of her skin. And the incisions are not visible. Why? Because here at St. Joseph Hospital, we do something called hidden scar surgery. And these incisions are hidden underneath the breast. If we can do it that way, we will. Here's another woman on the right who had a double mastectomy. The difference is her cancer was on the right, but it touched the nipple. So I was not able to save the nipple. I had to actually remove the nipple and some skin here. <clears throat> and if you look closely, you might see a very faint scar. That scar had to be put there because the cancer invaded the nipple. But her opposite breast is also re reconstructed. She had a mastectomy on the left, uh, on her left side to prevent breast cancer on the left side. So the right side was treatment, the left side was prevention. We were able to save her nipple on the left, no scars. The scar is down here in the bottom. Truly amazing work we do. And here is another woman. This woman, smaller breasted, had a breast cancer, and you can see her on top before surgery from the side, from the front, and then from the other side. And here she is on the bottom after surgery. Again, we saved her nipples, very tiny scars on both sides. But I think all of you would agree that all of these results are truly amazing. And some other exciting things we're doing at um, St. Joseph, something called sentinel lymph node biopsy. We we're able to save a woman from having all of the lymph nodes removed under the arm, where years ago we removed all the lymph nodes. We don't do that anymore. We only remove the necessary lymph nodes because this is a complicated operation with a lot of side effects. And in here, in here, just to orient you, this is the arm. Her head is up here. And this is the breast over here. This is her underarm. And in blue, you can see the lymph node. Why do we do that? We do this to try to identify any suspicious lymph nodes that might be filled with cancer that might mean that the cancer spread. So this is a very exciting technology. Again, less invasive, less side effects, much better tolerated, much quicker recovery. And some other things we're doing at St. Joseph, we have the brand new Breast Health Center. If you don't know about it, you can come by any time and we're happy to give you a tour. We do oncoplastic reconstruction. That's part of what we do to rebuild the breast to make it look as good, if not better than it did before the surgery. Hidden scar I just showed you. Skin and nipple saving mastectomy I showed you. We do other things now with 3D implants that are biodegradable, correct. They dissolve. We put the implant in. Once the breast is healed and the shape is maintained, the implant is dissolved in the body and goes away. Lymphedema pre prevention, that swelling of the arm, that has to goes a lot toward what I showed you with the lymph node surgery and other things, we do that. No longer do women have to get swollen extremities after breast cancer surgery. 
The chemotherapies, if a woman would need that, are now targeted and tailored. What does that mean? We treat each woman's cancer individually. In years past, everybody got the same chemotherapy. Now, we look at your particular cancer and we tailor the treatment, which is safer, better, less side effects, and it just is more effective. And we have all the high-risk screening tools here with all of the high-risk mammography, the 3D mammograms and everything else. We do it right here with our state-of-the-art imaging center. And of course, I showed you minimally invasive biopsy. So you're not alone. We're here for you. Remember, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but it's every month. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, just unmute and I'll be happy to take your questions. And I'll give you my website again. It's breastcarespecialist.com. You can see it right here at the bottom of the screen. And that's our phone number. If you, you or somebody you know is not getting checked or needs to have a problem solved, you know that they might have a problem, please feel free to have them reach out to us. Any questions? If not, I thank you for your attention. Good luck and God bless and stay healthy. Have a good night.